Literature and science are two subjects we don't usually associate with one another. But one of the things that surprised me when I first began to study legal history was the extent to which the law looked to both literature and science for guidance. And to illustrate this point today, I'd like to look at the work of one of the great underappreciated figures in the history of American law, John Henry Wigmore. Wigmore served as the longtime dean of the Northwestern University School of Law in the early 20th century. He was also the dominant figure in formulating the rules of evidence used in jury trials. And his work in the realm of evidence law poignantly captures how both literature and science can be models for crafting legal doctrine. Let's start with Wigmore's interest in literature. Shakespeare was his favorite. He always kept a Shakespeare play in his briefcase. Wigmore, uh, for instance, supported the rule in court that resemblance between a parent and a child was admissible to help establish paternity. And he relied on a scene in Shakespeare's King John in which a character called the Bastard Son says, but that I am as well begot, my liege, compare our faces and be judge yourself if old Sir Robert did beget us both and were our father and this son like him. Another evidence rule held that dying declarations were admissible as exceptions to the hearsay rule because approaching death ostensibly mitigated any earthly reason to lie. And again, Wigmore looked to the play King John to support this rule. On his deathbed in this play, the character of a French nobleman asks, what in the world should make me now deceive? Since I must lose the use of all deceit, why should I then be false if it is true that I must die here and live hence by truth? Henry VI served as a further Shakespearean reference for Wigmore in Wigmore's explanation of juror bias. Wigmore warned that when a physical object was admitted, was admitted in court, its very presence could carry a misplaced authority that would lead jurors to too readily believe allegations attached to the physical object. To substantiate his point, Wigmore referenced a scene in Shakespeare's Henry VI in which the leader of a mob attempted to convince a magistrate that he was really the son of an earl who had been kidnapped and uh, later became a bricklayer. And one of the leader's adherents, Smith the Weaver, adds for effect, Sir, he made a chimney in my father's house, and the bricks are alive at this day to testify it. Therefore, deny it not. Now, the existence of the bricks is wholly unrelated to the question of lineage. So we see Shakespeare speaking to the specious legitimacy of physical objects that so concerned Wigmore. If Shakespeare was Wigmore's favorite literary reference, then Charles Dickens was a close second. For example, Wigmore drew from Dickens's The Pickwick Papers in highlighting the potential of aggre uh, aggressive cross-examination to elicit unintentionally spurious testimony. Wigmore quoted a scene in which a character named Nathaniel Winkle, under the strain of an antagonistic cross-examiner and a hostile judge, was, quote, reduced to the requisite ebb of nervous perplexity, while two corroborating witnesses were similarly, quote, driven to the verge of desperation by excessive badgering. Dickens's Bleak House also provided literary support for Wigmore's opposition to theological tests that assess the capacity of a child witness to swear an oath. Wigmore was concerned that a court would needlessly invalidate the or ignore the testimony of a child merely because the youth lacked a mature understanding of religious conventions. He referred to a coroner in Dickens's novel who dismissed the testimony of a youngster called Little Joe because the coroner doubted um, the child's appreciation of divine punishment for perjury. The coroner, in describing Little Joe, exclaims, "He can't exactly say what'll excuse me. He can't exactly say what'll be done to him after he's dead if he tells a lie to the gentleman here, but believes it'll be something very bad. 
to punish him and serve him right, and so he'll tell the truth. Can't exactly say, won't do you know. We can't take that in a court of justice, gentlemen. It's a terrible depravity. Uh, interestingly, Wigmore contributed to, as well as borrowed from the fiction community, the author Arthur Train maintained a close relationship with Wigmore and consulted the dean for advice on plots in legal novels. In Crafting the Rules of Evidence, Wigmore also looked to the Bible as a source of authority. Next to the Shakespeare play he always kept in his briefcase, he always had a copy of the New and Old Testament. Wigmore insisted that a parent's conduct towards his or her child was admissible in proving lineage, and he recalled King Solomon's legendary resolution of a dispute between two mothers. In the first book of Kings, two women give birth within a few days, and one of the babies passes away. Both mothers claim parentage of the surviving infant, and King Solomon offers to divide the baby in two with a sword and give each mother half of the baby. While the imposter sanctions Solomon's judgment, the true mother protests, O oh my Lord, give her the living child, and in no way slay it. Solomon then rules in favor of the real parent, whose maternal concern betokened the actual kinship. Wigmore again referenced the Bible in justifying sequestering witnesses to prevent collusion between them. Uh, he, ma he mentions the history of Susanna uh, from the book of Daniel, in which the married Susanna rebuffs the advances of two men. In revenge, the men falsely accuse her of infidelity with another man, and the slighted suitors both claim that they had witnessed this illicit tryst take place under a tree in her husband's garden. Daniel separates the accusers and inquires what type of tree had sheltered this alleged adultery. When one answered may stick and the other home, Daniel exposed the inconsistency and exonerated Susanna. According to Wigmore, this episode catalyzed the time-honored practice of separating witnesses. While Shakespeare, Dickens, and the Bible were, were among Wigmore's most popular sources for evidence law, he relied on a host of other cultural figures um, for in crafting legal rules. Wigmore supported the use of reputation in court um, as evidence of character. And to this end, he cited Confucius's revelation, how can a man conceal his character? As well as Ralph Waldo Emerson's insight, human character evermore publishes itself. Wigmore referred to the Roman rhetorician Quintilian on the art of cross-examination. And to highlight the potential abuses of cross-examiners, Wigmore drew from the work of English novelist Anthony Trollope. Wigmore also made frequent allusions to non-legal authorities without citing them directly. Wigmore's declaration to cross-examine or not to cross-examine, that is the fundamental question offers us a clear echo of Shakespeare's Hamlet. Elaborating on an ancient anonymous proverb, Wigmore remarked, whom the gods wish to destroy, they must first make mad, which for legal precedence means they must first be misunderstood. In a final example, Wigmore was critical of what he considered to be the bench's mindless acceptance of the marital privilege doctrine, which um, allowed or in some cases prevented um, uh, spouses from testifying against each other. Um, so sometimes it, um, it said that you can, and sometimes it said you had the option not to. Um, so um, on this subject, he referenced characters in a Robert Southey poem. In the poem, the child Peterkin questioned his grandfather about the purpose of a fable war, to which the grandfather, Casper, replied, why that I cannot dwell, but twas a famous victory. Wigmore depicted a, quote, inquisitive little Peterkin at the bar who was questioning too rashly the postulates and platitudes of the Caspers of the profession and had to be satisfied with what was vouchsafed. Through these allusions, both explicit and implicit, Wigmore drew from literary and biblical sources to craft legal rules. Wigmore also looked outside of the law to modern scientific thought as a model for legal fact-finding. For most of the 19th century, American scientists had gathered facts, 
created taxonomies that organized these facts and induced uh, general principles that explained these systems of truths. But by Wigmore's day, a new mode of science had come to embrace the utility of hypothesis, active experimentation as an engine for generating knowledge, and the contingency rather than immutability of scientific findings. Wigmore displayed his break from outdated scientific practice when he chastised the bench and bar for their reticence to accept experimentation as part of judicial inquiry. Wigmore blamed, and I'm quoting here, juristic narrow-mindedness, an ignorance of precedence, a bigoted fear of everything not technical, an alarm at experimental evidence, and a disinclination to accept what does not come in accustomed shapes of certified copies, sealed instruments, and sworn depositions. Far from evincing a preference for the mere collection of data, Wigmore strongly believed in experimentation to produce valid evidence. Wigmore's willingness to accept scientific experts according to their own professional standards further signals his embrace of modern science. He chastised judges who excluded the testimony of persons recognized as scientific experts. Occasionally, quote, a court assumes to intrude in the technical domain of the engineer, the physician, and other scientific professional men, and to deny the possibilities of knowledge therein. Wigmore understood that a scientist has an inevitable, quote, reliance on the reported data of fellow scientists, learned by perusing their reports in books and journals. The law must and does accept this kind of knowledge from scientific men. To reject a professional physician or mathematician because the fact or some facts to which he testifies are known to him only upon the authority of others would be to ignore the accepted methods of professional work. Alongside his promotion of experimentation and respect for scientific standards, Wigmore accepted the modern scientific notion that agreement among experts was the litmus test for establishing truth. For example, to receive from a witness testimony premised on observations aided by an instrument, such as a microscope, the party had to establish the legitimacy of the instrument. According to Wigmore, if the appropriate science or art has advanced to a certain degree of general recognition amongst experts, then this trustworthiness may be judicially noticed as too notorious to need evidence. Wigmore also subscribed to the advanced scientific conception of truth as open to revision, in contrast to an earlier idea of absolute and immutable truth. His characterization of the law of evidence as embodying, quote, the living principles of evidence speaks to his intention to frame the subject within the parameters of contingency. Wigmore's view of law itself as dynamic rather than static dovetailed with the scientific ethos of provisional knowledge. While Wigmore certainly aspired to align evidence law with advanced scientific ideals, he also recognized that there were important differences between a laboratory and a courtroom. The limits of the legal system, such as the need for expediency and the lack of professional training for jurors, render judicial inquiry cruder than its scientific counterpart. Wigmore conceded, so far as the tribunal can attempt expressly to deal at all with logical questions, it can do so only roughly and loosely and in a general way. Another distinction was that a single scientist could consider all the available evidence and draw conclusions. Whereas, quote, the legal tribunal is divided in function. The judge passes first upon the evidence and sets aside tidbits for the jury. That which is not worth considering for one reason or another affecting its value never reaches the auxiliary functionaries, the jurors. While the analogy between science and law was admittedly inexact, Wigmore still sought to ground the rules of evidence on a solid scientific foundation. Wigmore was the greatest specialist in the history of American evidence law but he understood that his expert knowledge would only be enhanced by a broad reading of literature and science, as well as religion and philosophy. And if you'll allow me to close with just 
uh, a moment of editorializing, I think Wigmore is a consummate example of why, even in a world of hyper-specialization, a well-rounded education remains vital. Thank you. Freedom 101 is made possible by generous support from the University of Oklahoma Alumni Association. Freedom 101 is a program of the Institute for the American Constitutional Heritage at the University of Oklahoma. For more videos and podcasts, visit freedom.ou.edu. Thank you.